good morning everybody namaste welcome to sangam talks so as you all would have already read the title of the talk which is from kashmir to haridwar stories from across four generations so veena supadhyay ji is a senior reporter india and south asia for the new york based epoch times she is originally from the shivalik hills of jammu a dogra by ethnicity she is also authoring a series titled from kashmir to haridwar based on her research into the history culture and geopolitics of her region so in this talk from uh, the series uh, this is the first talk kashmir to haridwar and uh, journalist veena supadhyay ji is going to trace her ancestry from across four generations from northwestern himalayas and it's in this basin and brings across an amalgam of individual stories that crisscross through historical and significant geopolitical events of 20, 19th and 20th century so without taking any more time i would directly like to hand it over to venus ji thank you shruti uh, so much and namaskar everyone uh, it's a wonderful morning and uh, i'll be sharing my screen uh, just give me a moment so Kashmir to Haridwar is something that I started to discover about uh, two years ago, and these are very various individual stories. There are stories of individuals from my ancestry, and as I started to go through these stories, I realized that they uh, they crisscross through an amazing array of political, geopolitical, and cultural events in the past few centuries. So. I come from the northwestern Himalayas, from the Shivaliks of the northwestern Himalayas. Now, this is the Indus Basin. These are the northern frontiers of India. Uh, you know, these. This is the gateway of India. This is a civilizational hotspot. So, somewhere, these individual stories that I have been discovering, they give us a unique window into the in, into the history of the northern frontiers. So, when I was uh, growing up in Jammu. a school teacher a gold medalist in history from a renowned university said jammu has no history what do they have of their own i wonder from what perspective she said that she was a great teacher and i hope she is watching this those days when doordarshan was the only tv channel on the network our antennas could also catch ptv pakistan tv where we heard pakistani leaders talking their version of our story after the exodus of kashmiri pandits happened they brought in their own stories from across the banihal tunnel that links jammu to kashmir valley today came another set of stories of terrorism and violence borders from across pathan court brought in another set of tales while the media both national and global kept on pitching their narratives to us all of these motley mixes of historical folk propagandist geopolitical political separatist conflicted traumatic patriotic cultural nationalistic stories kept on pouring into our lives in jammu while most in india and abroad remained oblivious to our identity our identity as dogras dogras either meant the dogra maharajas whom some adored like gods are adored and others hated like demons are cursed british explorers called us the soldier race and the last 30 years of propaganda narratives about kashmir meant we are a part of a conflict story So while I was studying in Bangalore or while I worked in South India people asked how I lived in a place where bombs kept exploding and when I told them about my ancestral village in the Himalayan Shivaliks the lay malayalis fumbled with how the Himalayas can be something more than Badrinath or Kailash while the reality was back home there was no place as peaceful and as beautiful as my village My feet still gain excitement and pace when I reach the street of my maternal grandmother in downtown Jammu. I'm educated through my grandfather's perception of compassion and gaiety on one hand and adventures and belief on the other. We were people who fondly fed like other Indians on mangoes, slept on char pais in open verandas, danced in weddings to a heart's full, visited our temples with flowers and incense, gossiped and fought over silly things and yet came together amidst adversity. so what you know about us is not our reality and yet we can't detach ourselves from this whole narrative the narrative of conflict and borders maybe our story wasn't hijacked because we never told our story and this is one attempt today it's one attempt to tell a unique story of the dogras it's my attempt to tell my story it's my attempt at discovering my roots and identity and preserving the genius of my culture 
for a new and happening India. I call this talk from Kashmir to Haridwar, first stories from across four generations, which means I'm going to share with you cross-generational stories from my family and my research into how each of these people lived in a world of historical significance, as I mentioned earlier, in the northern frontier regions of India. These stories have helped me to look at a very significant time frame of Indian history through a window from within my ancestral home. I hope by the end of this, I would have rationally and with evidence proved that we Dogras have our stories. We share some realities with people from across each of our borders, but we have a unique identity. It's our responsibility to preserve and conserve it with as much or perhaps more interest than we zealously do to preserve our personal material interest. So this is a little note that I had written. This was the intent of today's presentation. Uh, now I'm going to go over to the presentation. So Kashmir to Haridwar. So when we look at this geography of Kashmir to Haridwar, we look at the geography of the northern frontiers. Here you can see a Google map where I have laid out, uh, you know, I've laid out three important civilizational routes. So you can see uh, in yellow, uh, this is basically the ancient Grand Trunk Road or the Uttarpatha, which passed through the Gandhara or the ancient Takshila region. Uh, you can see it coming all the way from Kabul, then passing through what is today's Peshawar, Rawalpindi, and then Sialkot, and then moving towards Lahore and further to Delhi and then to Kashi. So that was one ancient route that was uh, crossing through the northern frontiers. Uh, then here you have another route which is shown in blue. This was the Mughal road. So Mughal road was the actual route which connected Delhi to Kashmir uh, during the Mughal era. And uh, Today, the Jammu Kashmir Highway is basically through the through another mountain pass. But earlier, the only link between Delhi and Kashmir was actually through the Mughal route. The other in red, which you see, is basically the ancient Silk Route. The Silk Route is about fifteen hundred years old, and the and the in the bottom end, what you see is in orange dots. Those are basically the spots along the Shivalik mountain ranges through which I have found my ancestors moving, or those are the spots which are very important civilizational to my community. Uh, now, why I have laid out this map here, we will keep on you know, returning to this map time and again as we go through the various stories that I will discuss. In addition to these three routes, you also see certain things marked in white, white rectangle boxes. The one which is over Peshawar is actually Gandhara or Takshila region. So it was a civilizational hotspot. By civilizational hotspot, I mean that it was a knowledge center. It was a cultural center of significance. It was the ancient uh, intellectual capital of India, one of a very important, uh, you know, culturally, civilizationally, a very important place. The other uh, rectangle that you see is above Srinagar. So that is Kashmir. Kashmir, again, has been a very important civilizational hotspot. It is basically, um, you know, what you know today as the Sharda Peet. It was, again, a center of, uh, you know, learning, as I said, an important civilizational hotspot. And then you see something in a blue square. Now, this is, again, a very important place, but unfortunately, it is non not very known to the outside world. So before we go further into the presentation, I'll be talking about it. So you have this arrow number one, which points at this blue box. It is a place called Aknur today. So Aknur is on the western bank of the river Chenab. Ch Chenab River is a part of the Indus uh, river system. And um, it, it, in ancient times, it was called River Aksinni. And this is a very important place. In, today, it is a very important place because this is where the international border between India and Pakistan ends. And from this point, the disputed border between India and Pakistan starts. However, in the ancient past, it was very important because in Aknur, you find the northernmost precinct of the Harappan civilization. So if you have ever been to the National Museum in New Delhi, you can actually find artifacts unearthed from Aknur. Just a few kilometers uh, from the northern mounds of the Harappan site, uh, you find an ancient Buddhist site of Ambaram, which is a Kushan site. Um, in addition to this, uh, 
I think uh, many of us would be knowing the tragic love story of Soni Mahiwal. Uh, it has also been made into a Bollywood film. So Soni Mahiwal's story also happened in the, you know, the northwestern bank of the Chinab River, uh, somewhere around the region of Aknur itself. But right, these days it is on the other side of the border. But why I mention it in today's presentation? Because Soni, who was a Potter girl, was said to be from a village uh, of, on the bank of the river Chenab. And she fell in love with a trader who was on his way from Bukhara. So Bukhara is today in Central uh, Asia. And Bukhara was a very important spot in the ancient Silk Route. So he was on his way from Bukhara to Delhi. And he was passing through this region, this Chenab region of Aknur when he actually saw Sony. And then the story unfolds from there. So why am I sharing it again is because the story happens in this, uh, you know, Chinab River Basin. Um, and it signifies that this, uh, this and the story has happened during the Mughal era. So obviously it has happened along the Mughal road. So this signifies how connected this entire region was. So you have three routes, three important routes, you had the ancient Grand Trunk Road or the Uttrapatha. You had the Mughal Road and then you had the ancient Silk Route. And all these routes were crisscrossing through important civilizational hotspots like Gandhara and Takshila and Kashmir and Aknur. Further, uh, I would also like to mention that uh, historian Padmashri Shiv Nirmohi, he, he talks about the plying of chariots in ancient times between Sakla, which is the modern Sialkot, City, Sialkot is a twin city of Jammu. It is hardly about 20 to 30 kilometers from modern Jammu city on the other side of the border in Pakistan. Sialkot in ancient times was called Sakla. And Shiv Nirmohi says that chariots used to fly from Sakla to Aknur. And why I mentioned all these things just to let you know how important Aknur was civilizationally, but not much is known about Aknur today. Uh, to the contemporary, uh, within, within the historical uh, contemporary context of India. So now if we move through the three orange spots that I've mentioned here, the first spot, which is Jammu. So this is, I have an important community spot here. It is a Devi's shrine and it is called Syoti Mata. Syoti is a Dogri version of the word Sati. So in the ancient times, uh, women from the community had performed sati. Now, this sati wasn't performed in the context of widowhood, but something had happened due to which she performed sati. And then the shrine was erected to mark her sacrifice. And we have another family deity temple here. So this signifies that this was a very important spot of our community. Our community lived here. Then under certain circumstance, our community migrated from the Jammu Tavi Basin to basically the spot three. Now, spot three is again a very important civilizational hotspot. And I'll be coming uh, to that later in my presentation, why it was very important. Uh, this particular spot today is very important because it is the site of a mega hydro geostrategic project. But in the ancient times, there was an ancient Shiva temple here. It was linked to the ancient Grand Trunk Road, and uh, it was a very important civilizational hotspot. So when we look at the map of the northern frontiers, northern frontiers of India, the northern frontiers of India was basically, again, I'm repeating, was about civilizational routes. These routes were the gateway to the Indian civilization. Uh, and secondly, they were crisscrossed through a lot of civilizational hotspots or knowledge centers like Gandhara and Takshila and Kashmir and Aknur. So uh, scholar Subhash Kak in his essay, The Wonder That Was Kashmir, has written, for over a thousand years, Kashmir was one of the most creative places in the world. It made great contributions to the arts, aesthetics, sciences, literature and philosophy that are of abiding interest. Its approach to the problem of consciousness is of value to our times, for this issue represents the frontier of science and psychology. Its emphasis on aesthetics and beauty to find meaning in life resonates with modern sensibility. And I think the same holds from Gandhara and Takshila region as well. So 
what does civilizational hotspot means and in that context what does what do the northern frontiers mean for the indian civilization they mean advanced cognition which means very high skill sets of communication creativity innovation various knowledge traditions rich practices wisdom socio economic practices and traditions in, including traditions of language literature art styles architecture heritage and various other sciences so you look at this beautiful panoramic view this is where about 200 years ago my ancestors migrated to now why i have mentioned gaznavite invasions here because if you go back to the map that i have mentioned earlier uh from the gandhara and the takshila region somewhere where uh, peshawar is marked today the hindu shahis they fought the gaznavites for 25 long years and with each battle that they lost to the gaznavites they kept on losing their treasury and their land so the historical uh, evidences show a proof that some of the hindu shahis which were called pals after their defeat they moved into this region which is today my ancestral region so this panoramic view that i show you from here actually i can locate four different hilly kingdoms that various pal rulers they established um and this is the region where my ancestors also came in and this is from where we'll be further moving into a few individual stories so 200 years ago my ancestors came to a village which is called rampur rasul so rampur rasul are two twin villages in uh, district uh, in tehsil bilawa today in district katwa and this is a you know small hillock you can see here you can see this uh, wall uh, you know the stone wall the stone wall is actually the remains of a family pond a water body and the other the etchings that you see these are basically the carvings on a on a small spring on a perennial spring so when we talk about my ancestors we actually remembered our place of living 200 years ago marked by these two uh, landmarks now if you look at the etchings on the spring i've actually consulted a historian now this hasn't been scientifically proven uh, as of now but the first historian that i consulted told me that likely these carvings could be over 1000 years old they could even be 1400 to 1500 years old and they could they are most likely from the kushan period so this meant that this place of living this village was actually existing much before my ancestors came to this village now so my ancestors who were living in this village of rampul rasul the ancestor that i have been able to trace out his name was ramdhan and ramdhan had a son called duryodhan and that's where the story the family story becomes very interesting because duryodhan who was uh, you know who was a very well built man very tall and very strong he was sent on a family community on a community duty from these shivalik regions which were full of forest and full of water bodies and you know even today this region is full of forest so even in those days say 160 170 years ago 200 years ago this region was more full of forest and duryodhan was sent on a community duty to carry the ashes of the deceased to haridwar now obviously he was carrying would have been really special because Benazir. not many um, people were able to carry the ashes of the deceased to haridwar haridwar at that point of time so duryodhan he set on this journey and he reached haridwar this picture that you see is actually haridwar in 1860 this is how haridwar looked then and after finishing his community duty at haridwar duryodhan was passing through patiala now this uh, context is very important because patiala was not a part of the sikh kingdom it was not a part of the kingdom of ranjit singh Uh, patiala was a separate kingdom the kings of patiala they were more aligned with british from the very beginning so therefore they were very inclined in their thinking they were very western in their way of thinking so the kind of education practices and the policy making that they started in patiala was very influenced by british from the very early you know even before the british you know started to influence 
uh, you know, the other princely states in terms of policy making. Patiala was already very influenced by the British. So this meant that the kingdom of Patiala, through which the Ryodan was passing, it was a very important cosmopolitan uh, you know, city at that point of time. So when the Ryodan was passing through it, one of the kings, now this is Maharaja Mahindra Singh of Patiala, it was most likely his predecessor, but I haven't been able to yet uh, prove that. I don't have evidence of that. But somewhere in the mid 19th century, when Duryodhan was passing through Patiala, he saw a king, uh, you know, addressing a gathering over there. And something happened that, you know, uh, people started to, some kind of a, you know, event happened which caused panic and fear. And it would have, you know, people started to run hither and thither. And Duryodhan kind of managed all of them. And he, uh, you know, brought uh, calm to the possession. And thus he came into the notice of the, uh, you know, the Patiala Maharaja. And Patiala Maharaja offered him a job in the Patiala garrison. Now, uh, Patiala garrison is uh, very important. Again, I said because Patiala was not a part of the Sikh kingdom. Patiala was a separate kingdom. Patiala was from the very beginning aligned with British. So it was more contemporary, it was more cosmopolitan. Because of that, the Ryodan's two sons, they got educated in Patiala. Now that is one leg of the story. What is very interesting here is Maharaja Mahindra Singh of Patiala, who was born in 1852, and he became the king at the tender age of 1862. Um, he was told by somebody in Kashi, it was actually predicted for him, that if you do something in the field of education for your subjects, you, your name will become immortal. You'll be immortalized. So Mahindra Singh, from the very beginning, he kind of initiated a lot of reforms in the field of education in the Patiala kingdom. So thus, as a result of that, Patiala from the very beginning had a much better schooling system, had a much better, um, you know, much better thought of education policy. So at that point of time, uh, Mohinder Singh, Maharaja Mohinder Singh, in 1875, he set up the Mohinder Singh College, which is the oldest institution of contemporary higher education in India. At that point of time, it was an unparalleled institution from as far as Lahore and Delhi. There was nothing like it. Lahore University came up much later. So since the Ryodan had moved to Patiala and he was working in Patiala garrison, his two sons, they got the opportunity to be educated in Patiala. So since he moved to Patiala and he was working in the Patiala garrison, his two sons got educated in Patiala. Now, this was a rare opportunity and probably it was destined to be like this, if I can say, because there was no other center of higher education like this anywhere else in northern India at that point of time. And Mohinder Singh College, it produced many civil servants for various uh, king's courts, uh, princely states in those days. So since the Ryodan was working here, his son and my great grandfather, Sant Ram Dogra, he got educated in Mohinder Singh College. Uh, he was a rare person. He was extremely scholarly. He knew multiple languages. Some family accounts say he knew 15 to 17 languages. I do not have any evidence about it. And this is based on family folklore. Uh, but we know that he was a gold medalist from Mohinder Singh College. And this gold medal was actually instituted by Maharaja Mahinder Singh, which died at a very young age, who died at a very young age of 24 years. Um, and after that, after he passed from here, he became the first graduate in a contemporary BA of those days uh, in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And he was employed by Maharaja Pratap Singh of the Dogra Kingdom. Uh, he was employed uh, in the settlement office. Now, the settlement office in the Dogra Kingdom, it again has a you know, very important history. I'm not going to de go deeper into it because you know, we're going to deviate from our, our today's story. But land reforms and land settlement are a very important aspect of Kashmir's history. And Sant Ram Dogra, he was employed and put on special duty after the first land settlement commissions, which were led by British commissioners, 
they came to Kashmir. After that, he was put on special duty to codify the customs of the tribes of Kashmir. So this is a picture of Pandit Sant Ram Dogra, which I have been able to revitalize. It was a very old picture in very bad shape. And this picture was taken while Sant Ram Dogra won his duty, traveling around Kashmir, codifying the customs of the various tribes of Kashmir. Now, this was extremely important. Why? Because Kashmir at that point of time was a very heterogeneous society. So there were more or less no judicial, uh, you know, no judicial system. So whenever land inheritance happened, it happened according to the customs of the, of the tribe that the person was born into. But when it comes to civil disputes, there was no way, the state had no, dis no way to basically resolve those disputes. So therefore, these customs, they were codified so that they could be further made into a civil law. And that is what happened. So Sant Ram Dogra's work, it basically formulated a way which identified how the customs of the various tribes of Kashmir can have the power of law. So this is the work that he did. There is an, um, a very important aspect of Pandit Sant Ram Dogra's history from here on after 1950 when he was commissioned to do this work by the Maharaja. And what it means in Kashmir history, I'll come back to it later. But before that, I want to talk about Pandit, Pandit Sant Ram Dogra's village. So Pandit Sant Ram Dogra's village and my ancestors, they were living in a village called Bhadu. So Bhadu is, um, you know, in, again in Tehsil Bilawar. It is about 20 kilometers from Rampur Rasool, where Duryodhan and Ramdhan lived. And it was actually the village of Santram Dogra's wife, whose name was Jia. Uh, now, I'm specifically mentioning these names because uh, the names also signify a lot of history and a lot of civilizational makeup. And why I find it very important to talk about Bhattu today is because Bhadu is an extremely important place civilizationally. You see here uh, a tree, and on the base, base you can see these rocks carved. You see some nagas carved on it. Just opposite to this tree, basically, were the ancient forts, the palaces of the rulers of Bhadu. And Gulab Singh, who formed the kingdom of Jammu and Kashmir, his mother was actually born in this kingdom. So when in 1822, uh, Jammu was given to Gulab Singh by Maharaja Ranjit Singh, after that, he sent his brother to conquer the various hilly states, including the hilly state of his own uncles. So Gulab Singh and his brother, they actually dethroned their own uncle who was ruling over Bhadu. And this kingdom also fell into their, uh, you know, into their larger estate. The person that you see on the right is actually a very important poet, but he's not very known to the outside world. He is called Kavi Dattu. Kavi Dattu is a renowned Dogri poet. But what is very interesting and astounding is that Dattu used to also write in Braj Bhasha. See, he was uh, somewhere from the 18th century, and he also wrote in Braj Bhasha. He wrote in Sanskrit. Uh, a lot of his work is lost, and he also wrote in Dogri, and he was born in village Bhadu. So uh, I think the rest of the India would not know that somewhere in a remote Shivalik village was born a person who would write in Braj Bhasha. How important was Braj Bhasha? Was Braj Bhasha known outside, you know, its uh, traditional base? How come a person who lived in a remote hilly kingdom in the Shivaliks? Uh, new Braj Bhasha. Uh, so I think all, all these are very important questions. Now, around Bhaddu today, you find 22 springs. 22 springs, because this is what you know people told me. There are 22 freshwater perennial springs. There are five rivers. And these five rivers, they join together at the rear end of the Bhaddu. The confluence of these five rivers is a place that is called Panch Tirthi. And Panch Tirthi is in route from, you know, linking these hilly regions to Jammu and to Sialkot. Gurnal 
is again another ancient site. It is about 10 kilometers away from Jammu on the bank of the one of the rivers which then come to this point and join the confluence. Uh, Gurnal is an abandoned site uh, uh, where an ancient Kashi-like city was being built. It is, uh, you know, in the town of Bilawar. Badu and Bilawar are again twin towns. They are about 10 kilometers away from each other. So Gurnal is a very important civilizational hotspot, but again, it lies undiscovered. This, on the right, what you see on the top, the water body is actually the biggest spring of Gurnal. Uh, and you can just look at its condition. Uh, there is an historian who has studied it, and uh, I've also written about it before. Uh, this is estimated to be about 1,600 years old, but nothing much more has been done on it. Around Bhadu, you also place an, uh, find another important place called Babre Danal. Babre Danal is a place from where Babur, when he was moving from Afghanistan to India, you know, before he uh, came landed in Delhi. Uh, and set up the Mughal Empire. He was, when he was migrating from Afghanistan to India, his battalions or his troops, they did not really uh, come through one route. They actually followed a multiple routes. So one of the battalions of Babur, they passed through this route. And why the locals remember this, there's a folklore that at this particular spot called Babre Danal, a lot of infighting happened between Babur's troops, leading to a lot of bloodshed and death. So that is, again, that place is also, uh, you know, in this place. And then around Bhadu, you actually find temples in ancient Nagra style of architecture. So this signifies that Bhadu is, again, a very important civilizational hotspot. Now, while Kandhara and Takshila, they have been unearthed and a lot of research has happened on them. Well, a lot of researchers have also done a lot of work on Kashmir. Not much is known about places like Bhadu and Bilawar. A very scattered information is there. Now, at the bottom end, right side, you see the feet of idol, uh, God. Um, they, this idol is basically 1,000 years old. Uh, and according to my estimates, uh, this belonged to the Palvanshis and the Hindu Shahis uh, who ruled a thousand years ago in Gandhara and Takshila before the invasions of the Ghaznavites. Uh, I am not allowed to divulge anything more than uh, this about the idols. Uh, it is somebody's property and I do not have permission to basically share more. This is the ancient temple of Shiva in Bilawar. Surprisingly, it also has an idol of Goroknath. Most likely, it is also a Hindu Shahi monument. Now, so that is why I wanted to go through the, you know, place from where uh, Sant Ram Dogra came. And this is where my ancestral homes are there today in the village Badu. Coming back to Sant Ram Dogra. So after Sant Ram Dogra finished his work, uh, according the customs of the tribes of Kashmir, in 1918, he was on his way back uh, from Kashmir to this hilly village of Badu. At that time, there were two routes linking Kashmir to the rest of the world. One was the Mughal road, as I shared in my initial map. So the other was through this, you know, tunnel, which is uh, today, Jammu and Kashmir Highway. But until the Dogra Kingdom, uh, when the Dogra Kingdom uh, started to rule over Jammu and Kashmir, this route basically was uh, a personal route for the Dogra kings. It didn't have a road and they used to actually track. This route was earlier known uh, uh, to the, uh, to, you know, basically. Uh, not many people, and it was not a very popular route, but it was used by rebels or it was used by decoys or it was used by princes uh, or princely interages. So in 1921, you can see this is the uh, this is the image of the tunnel, Banihal Tunnel. It's called the Banihal Mountain Pass. Uh, so this is a National Geography image of how Banihal Tunnel was 1921. 
and in 1922 was the first time when this route banihal route between jammu and kashmir it opened to the rest of the world but when in 1980 sant ram dogra was returning from kashmir to jammu through this route a little away from this route somewhere on the outskirts of anantnag he got killed and uh, his body actually never came back home only his ashes came back home um he was given a state funeral but under what circumstances it died uh the family was never clear about it it was said that he was killed in a conspiracy but that's a different story and i'm not going to go deeper into it but why i started to dig into this entire ancestry of mine is because of my interest into santram dogra's life and why he got killed his uh, the important work he did in the history of kashmir and under what circumstances he got killed was he killed because of the importance of his work is something i'm still to discover so i will not talk about more on that uh but there is another offshoot of family history which is very interesting and which i wanted to discuss here so pandit sant ram dogra had a daughter and uh his daughter was married to professor gauri shankar professor gauri shankar again comes from a very illustrious history um uh, this this is his picture which my family had uh this is his pre wedding picture so uh i think at that time he might be about 19 to 20 years of age and at that time he was uh, studying in the government college lahore he was a student of sanskrit he did his he did his ma in the government college lahore and he was a village called flawala flawala village about 10 kilometers from akhnu again akhnu is that important civilizational hotspot that i mentioned earlier in my presentation so in 1932 gauri shankar pandit gauri shankar he was the first person from jammu and kashmir to be sent to oxford university on a full scholarship for dlit now everything about his life is very intricately interlinked with the cultural and the civilizational history of kashmir so i'm going to dig you know i'm going to delve further deeper into it and that is why i'm talking about this individual story separately so pandit gauri shankar was the son of uh, pandit baldev raji who was a shastri a sanskrit scholar and baldev raji was the son of pandit kripa ram ji now kripa ram ji was a very important figure because when the second dogra maharaja maharaja ranbir singh he set up a rare library of sanskrit manuscripts in jammu in what is today the famous ragunath temple he appointed pandit kripa ram ji as the first librarian of that library so uh now even today ragunath temple has some of the rare and the rarest sanskrit manuscripts so from that same lineage came professor gauri shankar Professor Gauri Shankar worked on a great Sanskrit Mahakavya, which was known as Shiva Swamin's Kapina Buddha Buddhaya, which is actually a great Mahakavya. It is a Sanskrit Mahakavya, and he was sent to research on this. His delight was on this Shiva Swamin's Kapina Buddha Buddhaya, and he could not find an original Sanskrit manuscript. but in 1933 he found an oriya manuscript of uh, shiva swamin's work and then he learned oriya language and then transcribed the work into devanagari and that was his thesis so during partition when he was living in lahore he lost a lot of his work and he had to flee uh, in his home in krishnagar in lahore now later on there was a famous german professor of classical sanskrit and tibetan literature uh professor dr khan he found one copy of his work professor gauri shankar's work and later he also found an original sanskrit manuscript of shiva swamin's work in nepal and very surprisingly he found a missing portion in japan now why is shiva swamin very important here because shiva swamin was a kashmiri poet about 1100 years ago so uh interestingly professor gauri shankar he was a brahmin of sandila gotra and he traced his ancestry to some stock as 
Lokmanya Tilak. He was a Maharashtrian. His ancestors were of Maharashtrian Brahmin stock. His ancestors came to Dugar or the Dogra land and settled near Aknur. And as I've mentioned, Aknur is an important civilization and hotspot. I continue to repeat it again because it is still undiscovered after being employed as Purohits of the Bahauratpurs, who were at that point of time ruling over a kingdom in Aknur. So this is a Professor Gauri Shankar's image, you know, with his thesis, this is Oxford thesis. So I'm coming back to the map again. Now, why I discussed all these variegated stories from my ancestry? Because, again, I said they've been crisscrossing through a lot of mountain routes, mountain passes, in this basin, low Shivalik ranges. They've been crisscrossing through many civilizational hotspots, um, including knowledge centers. So let's, let's assess the entire, all these stories again on this map. So the yellow is actually the ancient Grand Trunk Road, the ancient Grand Trunk Road, which uh, linked Central Asia to northern frontiers of India and further to Central India. The Mughal Road, which connected Srinagar to Delhi, and therefore Mughal Road also connected the Silk Route to Delhi. So that was one of the routes from the Silk Route to Delhi, another was from Leh to Amritsar and then to Delhi. And the blue spot is the Aknur. A lot of stories that I've discussed today have crisscrossed either through Aknur or they have crisscrossed through Srinagar or through these orange spots between which my ancestors moved. I am yet to discuss the second spot, the second orange spot. This is an ancient lake called Mansur. Mansur is again a very historical lake and the Greeks have come as far as this lake. So it was again on ancient routes. It is linked to the legacy of Vasukinag and Rishi Kashipa. So whether it is Rishi Kashipa or it is Kashipa Buddha, whose story is 7,500 years old, which is uh, actually 5,000 years before Buddha Sakyamuni. Uh, so that's about the second spot. My intention behind sharing this map and laying out all these stories across these various routes is just to understand them from civilizational perspective. So civilizational hotspots, uh, through these stories I've understood, so all of these individual stories are very important and significant, you know, in their own uh, individual context. I also want to assess them from civilizational point of view. So civilizational hotspots are not necessarily static hotspots geographically. For example, Hu Sang, when he visited Gandhara in the city of Purshapura, which is today's Peshawar, he found many Buddhist shrines and admitted the existence of a hundred Brahminical temples. But he particularly mentions two. First was the Tower of the Patra, the begging bowl, bowl of Buddha, which was actually at that time he mentions that he couldn't find the bowl because it was taken to Persia. Uh, and later on, it was found somewhere in Kandhara until about 2014 when ASI was doing some research on it, trying to decipher some Persian inscription of it in, on it. It was actually in the Museum of Kabul. I'm not sure where this uh, Patra is today. But Hu Sang, first he talks about this Tower of Patra. And second, he talks about a Hindu establishment called Panj Tirtha, consisting of five little tanks or holy bathing spaces protected by fig or banyan trees. And he says that this Panj Tirtha lies northeast of the native city between Grand Trunk Road and the railways set up by the British at that point of time. When the British came in, obviously, during Hugh Sangs, there were no British. But when we geographically see the location of this road, it was between the ancient Grand Trunk Road and the railways, which was set up by the British. So if you look at this image, it is actually the Panch Tirtha at the rear base of village Badu. And this temple that you see, it has been, you know, cemented in the recent past but it is an ancient Shiva temple with a Mukhalinga in it. And the history around this temple is almost 
about 1500 years old it can be traced when a ruler from almora had come to this place and established a kingdom here and then you have you know the hindu shahis coming to this place and the hindu shahis establishing their kingdoms around the hindu shahis also came from gandhara so does this mean that the panch tirtha in gandhara had some link with the panch tirtha in this remote region of jammu in my ancestral region now you look at this image this is basically a lithograph of uh, maharaja gulab singh's fort but there are many other interesting things to study here in civilizational context so you see the hillock and you see the fort on top of it now the first arrow that you see towards the left you have a panch tirtha here as well and you have that panch tirtha as a locality in jammu even today and it is on the banks of the river tavi as you can see um whether these three panch tirthas have some connection is something that only historians can find out but i found it very interestingly when i looked into my ancestry of the northern frontiers another if you look at this arrow that i have uh, given at the base of the hill you have an ancient cave here which today is called the peer ko temple uh and it was said as children as when i was a child i used to visit this cave every weekend with my parents uh, it was a natural cave and it was said that the cave had uh, you know a further passage that went all the way to shri nagar and there are legends about it there are folklores about it they said that this cave was closed after few months they went through the cave and they never came back and i remember as a child i have seen a grill go, grill gate on this cave uh and we used to look inside obviously we couldn't see anything but these days it has been permanently closed and it has been cemented uh these caves are very similar to the caves uh that you find in ujjain uh i wonder if there is some connection the other two arrows that you see on the uh right one is the bahu fort which has devi temple and professor sindhu uh professor sindhu kapoor uh, who is a noted scholar from jammu she says that the idol in this temple was actually brought in to the spot in the 8th century uh from ayodhya further uh you know towards the left in the right you see the second arrow this is a uh, again another devi temple it is called the mohamaya temple i'll come to this temple again but before that look at this right arrow these are the three hills of vaishno devi so the trikuta hills so the trikuta hills basically overlook the entire uh jammu city so i basically wanted to discuss uh you know this jammu as a civilizational hot spot uh and it signifies that there was a lot of civilizational interconnectivity uh basically a lot of communication was happening between the knowledge uh the civilizational hot spots of the region that is what is kashmir what is kandhara what is my ancestral region uh one which is in panch tirthi in the shivali hills and another which is in jammu what is today's downtown jammu another important thing is this is a book called the life of marpa marpa was a tibetan siddha he was from tibet obviously he was the guru of another renowned tibetan siddha called milarappa and marpa came to india four times for uh, teachings you know for for learning for meeting gurus and he mentions here something which is very significant he says that marpa wanted to learn two traditions of practices so the first tradition he mentions and the second tradition he mentions is the mahamaya and then it says these names are both the names of the yadav and of the yantra 
the text that describes the practice of this yidha. So the instructions of the Mahamaya Tantra from the eccentric yogin Kukuripa. So Marpa had actually come to Kukuripa for the Mahamaya Tantra teachings. Surprisingly, there is a Mahamaya temple here. If we go back to the slide, there is a Mahamaya temple here where I'm pointing out towards the right, the arrow uh, in the center. And nobody knows the exact history of this place. So my intention behind sharing all these motley mix of so many stories, including the individual stories of my sisters, how they moved from one region to another, uh, you know, the rare stories that I found from the northern frontiers, the questions I had, is because I see this entire, entire region in context of knowledge societies. Now, what was the significance of knowledge societies? Knowledge societies were basically like feeders or nurturers. They were like mothers. So that is why if you see Kashmir, Kashmir was known as the Sharda Peet. So the mother Sharda, uh, which is the knowledge giver. They were very much linked with civilizational evolution. The civilizational evolution was basically in context of knowledge, wisdom, cognition, in terms of self-awareness, in terms of self-evolution. The knowledge societies had rare institutions. These rare institutions were not characterized by brick and walls or mortars. But these institutions were characterized by thought leaders. So if there was Marpa who came all the way from Tibet to look for uh, some knowledge, or to look for rare knowledge from Siddhas in India, he didn't come to so-and-so school which consisted of brick and mortars. He actually came to the gurus. He came to the Siddhas. So the institutions were actually signified by the Siddhas. These institutions, so therefore, were signified by thought leaders and the principles that they personified. They, and that basically is what constituted an ecosystem of learning. Most of these knowledge societies, as I mentioned, whether they, that was Gandhara, Takshila, Kashmir, or what was in Akhnur, or what was in the Panchti, Thine, my ancestral region, they were cross-connected. So they were continuously communicating, interacting, and where knowledge was being dissipated. So it was not that, for example, Panchti, Thine, my ancestral region is a very remote region. So it was cut off from rest of the society. And it is a so-called backward region, as in today's contemporary policymaking terms, it can be called a backward region. It was not so. Civilizationally, it was a very rich region and it was cross-connected. And these connections were more based on individuals rather than external means of communication, which means that even if there were no roads or even if there was no transport, still these regions were con connected because they were connected because of the rare breed of individuals who lived in these regions. And in this context, the evolution of the human faculties matter. I'm sorry, that's not facilities, it's actually faculties. So when I went about discussing all these stories, I realized, I'm going to go back on the map. So again, if we relook at this map and we'll relook at these routes, various uh, geographical routes, which basically linked the northern gateway of India to the Indian civilization. These are the routes through which knowledge, civilization, as well as invaders have come into India. But while we do remember the invaders, while we do remember today's contemporary cross-border problems, because today we have a very militarized border cutting through all these routes and cutting through this region, we have forgotten our real civilizational heritage and history. And the intention behind finding the individual stories of my sisters was basically to understand my lineage and the history and the heritage of the wider northern frontiers. Thank you so much, Venus Ji. Uh, I must say, via this first part of the series, you have laid a very intriguing uh, precedence to what is going to be a very rich, civilizationally rich series in the upcoming days. And uh, with this, I would like to open the session for questions from the audience members.
ministry i have a question sure so uh, you did mention about the land related disputes i'm talking about the sant ram dogra ji story so you mentioned about the land related disputes in that era yes. so uh, primarily why was there a need of an assessment uh, of land holding rights in that time which uh, the maharaja felt it's a very yes. important question uh, shruti see the land settlement as an exercise was taken up by british in all the other princely states and other regions of india as well that had already happened and by the time it started in jammu and kashmir the first british uh, settlement commissioner arrived in jammu and kashmir in 1895 and is a very well known commissioner his name was i think he was popularly known as lawrence sahib he also wrote the first encyclopedia on kashmir uh, you know um the valley of kashmir is the name of his book so by the time the settlement commission came to uh, came to jammu and kashmir uh all these kind of exercises had already been done by british in other parts of the country now why it was important in jammu and kashmir my understanding is if you look at the history of jammu and kashmir the dogras like uh, uh, gulab singh he got kashmir the valley of kashmir in 1846 he had got jammu by 1822 from ranjit singh and after that uh, in 1834 he conquered ladakh and in 19 1840 he conquered baltistan so by the time the anglo sikh war took place he actually had conquered 84 jagirs around the valley of kashmir so the british were still 300 kilometers away from kashmir whereas the dogras were present right on the borders of the valley of kashmir when he took over in 1846 the sikhs had ruled over the valley of kashmir for over two decades before the six it was the afghans who had ruled over valley of kashmir for few decades if i am not wrong and before that it was mughals who had ruled over the valley of kashmir for a long period of time so by the time it came to dogra so if you look at the dogra history 1846 gulab singh consolidated the whole thing right but he died shortly after that his son ranbir singh took over ranbir singh was the actual person who, who sent lot of forces for further expansion now after and here seeing the expansion of the dogra kingdom did not happen now what this mean is by the time the kingdom had got consolidated so by the time it came to pratap singh it is at that point of time that the judicial reforms actually started so some kind of a judiciary some kind of a reforms in that way you know they started to be formulated now why land reforms were important or land settlement was important in that context because before that you know before dogras you had six so six would have introduced their own you know uh, policies and stuff like that though they ruled for a very short period of time so i've only read that they ended up giving various jagirs before that it was the afghans so the afghans has also introduced some policies and all they would have also given their jagirs and before that it was mughals the mughals had actually established an entire revenue system so when you talk about land settlement it's not just land boundaries it's also about revenue it's about state policies it's about a lot of things so by the time it came to dogra it was a motley mix of all these policies because those policies were not cohesive like the contemporary world policies right so they were they were a mixture of what the six left and what the afghans left and what the mughals left and when the dogras won over they were the kingdom states so when they won over to pacify and to win over people the dogras also gave lot of jagirs in kashmir so when the british came over and the british influence started after the british resident came into kashmir they set up this land commissioner so that they could you know bring in some sense of order some reform into that you know the, the mixture of uh, whatever revenue you know chaotic land system policy system and revenue system existed at that point of time so that is why the uh, settlement commissions were very important initially and when santram dogra was brought in on special duty to codify the customs of kashmir 
it was again because kashmir was a very heterogeneous society so uh, there were various tribes uh, so even among the pandits also you know uh, there was a there was a custom which actually defined traditions inheritance all these things and among the muslims also there were various you know offshoot offshoots of muslims and within them there was various tribes and various sub tribes and each had its own customs so whenever a conflict happened which is very bound to happen in a civil society there was no way to look into it so what would be a standardized way to look into those civil complaints so that is why this was the first attempt by sant ram dogra to codify the customs of kashmir and to understand what would be a standardized version that would give those customs the force of the law so then it becomes a state reform a part of the state civil judiciary system before that it was nothing it was chaos and hotpot thank you venus ji for the details just as you mentioned that uh, sandram dogra was appointed to codify the customs and traditions of that particular region and indeed it is a very controversial exercise or an attempt to even begin with so do you think that there is a specific reason why santram dogra only was elected for the same or uh, probably do you think it is ultimately related to uh, his his demise in the later years i think both are true first why he was elected i think because he studied in patiala right so patiala rulers uh, as i mentioned they were from the very beginning very aligned with the britishers their policies from the very beginning were very western in their approaches they they had a very advanced educational policy um and the sikhs were, you know the anglo sikh war happened because obviously the sikhs were trying to you know protect their interests from the british so you can very well say that the british and the sikhs were not actually on the same page in the beginning now santram dogra he studied in patiala right so he studied under british professors so he would have been more tuned in with the with the british policy making um so i think that was one reason that he first he was more tuned with the british system he was educated in a contemporary education system at that point of time and he was on top of that at dogra so he knew the languages of the place and he knew multiple languages as i said family folklore says that he knew 16 to 17 languages um uh, i've tried to look into it and it could be quite true because before the ba course started in mohindra college mohindra college had various language courses arabic persian and various other courses in which students could basically specialize so since he lived and studied in patiala it's very likely and he was brilliant so it's very likely that he knew multiple languages so his skill sets his competencies and his background his ancestry actually made him the best fit for the job that he was given okay uh so we had and one... why he was killed uh, sorry there your yeah. other question i think that somehow his work his important work is linked with his death some people say that his adversaries got him killed because he was to rise to a prominent position in the court and but i don't give to that because he was a civil servant right he was appointed by the king uh so it's very unlikely that somebody could kill some civil servant just like that right you you have to have a very uh, strong reason backing some kind of a thing for killing such an important person so the reason is not yet known to me in fact my entire series kashmir to haridwar it started with somewhere with a quest to understand the time of my great grandfather and i think with that i've ended up discovering a lot of wider history that's beautiful actually we truly enjoyed uh, you explaining about it or setting the context to the upcoming talks so we have one question in the chat box it is by rao kumbhji he is asking sanskrit manuscript which are lost and found in regional language is there any effort to collect and preserve those 
in jammu there are efforts for example as i mentioned i think dogra rulers from the very beginning they were making efforts on this and i was also thinking that why would the second dogra maharaja ranbir singh he would set up a library of sanskrit manuscripts in ragunath temple so until and unless the region has some tradition of it why would he even think about it right so obviously the region had some tradition of it and i think i have been geographically on the map able to lay it out so ragunath temple does have rare sanskrit manuscripts and there are other attempts i've recently met people who've been trying to basically preserve these manuscripts on open source platforms which i can later share with you and uh, you know maybe you can put it along with the youtube link um but there are there is also a lot of heritage which is lost that is also true um for example kandhara takshila region other than what the british discovered or the british unearthed what do we actually know you know even this tower of patra the the bowl of buddha sakyamuni uh, which uh, during invasions and all you know it was taken to persia and then it was found in kandhara and then eventually it was found in the uh, you know kabul museum when asi was trying to study it in 2014 they were trying to study the persian inscriptions on it now from where did the persian inscriptions come is another question uh so so how much can you unearth of the the geographical region you know the the funny thing is that in the course of my working on kashmir to haridwar i actually came across the purohits of hindu shahis and this has been 13th to 14th generation of him of of the purohits of hindu shahis Uh, who came to me and who said we found all our ancestral records through these various lineage records that we found in the sacred uh, you know sacred spots like haridwar and kashi and prayagraj and you know there are few few other spots like that so though some amount of heritage sanskrit manuscripts they are preserved but a lot is also lost that's very interesting venus ji yeah just to and- add to that for example when gauri shankar ji had to do his phd thesis right shiva swamin is a very important kashmiri poet uh, he has written sanskrit mahakavyas so mahakavyas are like kalidasa has written mahakavyas you know he has written mahakavyas and his sanskrit seems to be of a very refined order uh, but even in gauri shankar's time in 1933 he couldn't find an original copy of um shiva swamin's work so he could find an oriya version and then he learned oriya to translate it into sanskrit but eventually dr han found it somewhere in nepal so you can just understand the uh, you know how much has been lost in course of time the some has been preserved but a lot has been lost first there was no sanskrit manuscript available of Shiva Swamin's work but Shiva Swamin was already identified as a very important Sanskrit poet as a poet of Sanskrit mahakavyas so obviously Agori Shankar's uh, patrons his professors were basically some very renowned indologist british indologist so they knew that he is from kashmir they knew his background you know gori shankar ji just said that uh, he mastered some of the great things in sanskrit i am not a sanskrit scholar so i am not able to talk about it at the age of 5 now he had that kind of family lineage his father was like that his great his grandfather was like that um so they knew that shiva swamin existed they knew that he was an important poet they knew his work and actually in general you know the story which the sanskrit the sanskrit mahakavya talks about but he didn't have a copy of the mahakavya it was difficult to find it so he found it somewhere in orissa today we might think that you know orissa is so far away how can it be linked and stuff like that but i don't think so i think ancient societies were already linked maybe they didn't have modern means of transport but they were always linked otherwise how can you how can you understand that in my region you had ancient temples in nagara style of architecture 
Nagra style of architecture is the same architectural style, style as you find in Orissa. So, and if uh, in the seventh century, a ruler from Almora, central Himalayas, can come all the way to northwestern Himalayas and set up a kingdom in Panch Tirtha, then that means that this world was very connected. So, I think. There should be no doubt. And if Ashoka could send out missionaries from crisscrossing through everywhere in India, reaching all the way to Central India and Southeast Asia, then I think there is no doubt that civilization was very interlinked. Maybe uh, modern humankind has lost some human faculties. We've lost our comprehension of understanding linkages and connections, which I think are not just uh, dependent on modern means of transport. You know, I have seen my uncle, for that matter, near Bhaddu, there is an ancient temple. Uh, it is called Bala Sundari. It is the top of a mountain. So it takes, you know, to a person like me, it takes about four hours. And I have gone there it's about 15 years ago, not after that. And my uncle, who is at least 40 years older to me, he climbs the same thing in one hour like this, straight. So, you know, it's my faculties, my abilities and his abilities are different. And I've even talked to older people in my region. They've told me that from Bhaddu, they could take the old route, the river route, and reach the Jammu Padhankot Highway in six hours by foot. And from there, they could take Tonga or something and reach Jammu City, which means that in one day, they could actually cover this place, this route. So if they were travel on, traveling on horses, or if somebody would be traveling from Sialkot on horse to my region, I guess it would take only six hours, depending on the proficiency of the horse rider. If the horse rider was very proficient, it would even probably take less a number of hours. So that is how connected we were. And I know this is very possible because my grandfather was a very able horse rider, and I've heard a lot of stories you know, about him riding horses in the hills. So this is about lifestyle and this is about people's abilities and fecundities and culture. It's a very valid question. Uh, I too think about it. You know, I was thinking that if you look at Indian civilization, there were two ways to reach it. One was you can reach it through the ocean, so through the sea routes. So with the aid of the sea winds, particularly the southwest monsoon, monsoons. And that's what most of the European powers, whether they were Portuguese, Dutch, French, or English, they've actually reached India through the sea. So that was one way of reaching Indian civilization from the ancient past. The other way, and the only other way to reach Indian civilization was through the northern frontiers. So you would come through these mountains and the mountains passes, which means the trans-Himalayan mountains and mountain passes, and then the Himalayan mountains and mountain passes. And then you would reach the plains of India. Actually, you would first reach Punjab. And by Punjab, I don't just mean the modern political boundary of Punjab. By Punjab, I mean the Indus Basin in those five mighty rivers of in, uh, mighty channels of the Indus. So. When invasions have happened, you know, it's geography and it's geopolitics. So as the kingdoms have changed, you know, in the Middle East and the Central Asia, and from there as the invaders have come in, their first touch with the Indian civilization was with the northern frontiers. And that's where these invaders have the most influence. So further as you go to south, you see many of these ancient temples preserved, right? Until Central Asia, uh, Central India, you can see that the invaders have destroyed a lot of temples. So that means that's when, when still the invaders have come. Whereas you go in the northern frontiers, today if you go to Kandahar and Takshala, whatever you find over there is what was on earth during the British time. After that, uh, whatever work would have been later done, and it depends upon the state the political uh, you know, situation in a country. For example, in today's Afghanistan, what can you expect uh, from the Kabul Museum? Um, I haven't really read the news, but there have been concerns about it. Um, you know what happened with the 
uh, you know, with those massive Buddha statues, I found the name. I forgot the name of. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Those massive Buddhas in uh, in Afghanistan, which were destroyed by Taliban. Um, so it depends upon politics and geopolitics. I, I hope I have been able to answer your question. And that's where these individual stories become all the more important because whatever is lost from collective, collective memory and uh, collective uh, civilizational cognition is still preserved in individual stories and in family heritage. So if we have to conserve it and look into it, family heritage and individual stories can actually be a very important source of information. Since we are uh, discussing all of this, Venus Tree, uh, I can't help but question that why is that this particular region remains unearthed, unearthed by our archaeologists or iconographists uh, while putting it as a part of our history or the rich civilization of Bharat? What do you think would be the reason why they did not cover this as comprehensively as other regions of northern uh, belt of our civilization? See, a lot of unearthing of the northern frontiers, they started during the British time. So, for example, I have a lovely book here. Maybe I can try to show you the book. Uh, it is called Notes on the Ancient Geography of Gandhara. Uh, it is a commentary on a chapter of Hugh Sang, and it is Alfred Charles Auguste Foucher. So it's again a European who has who has actually written a commentary on the chapter of Hugh Sang. So most of the Indologists that you see, they came from Europe. It was because there was a lot of interest generated as when the colonial powers, they started to discover the subcontinent. They started to unearth, you know, during their expeditions in the mountains or the territories, you know, they started to come across some inscription, something somewhere, you know, that is how even Ashoka's first inscription was unearthed. And then, you know, they set up these studies and these commissions and these teams, and then they further dug into it. And then they dug up all these mounds and stuff like that. But the geopolitics of the last 75 years when the partition happened, it drew more challenges to this entire process of collective discovery because then you had a border in between something there were somehow there were a lot of ideology changes between the governments on the two sides the priorities on the two sides had changed whereas before partition the entire region was under one administration so obviously it was different when it was done by british and after uh, you know the british left when Pakistan came up and India came up, since partition, there have been four wars between India and Pakistan. Our border has been a very militarized border. We know that it's a nuclear flashpoint also. And surprisingly, this entire kingdom put up together by the Dogra rulers, this today, what the Dogra rulers had consolidated as one territory, today it is control, though it is disputed, it is controlled by three different countries. So when you talk about this entire northern frontiers, this civilizational hotspot, and you say Gandhara and Takshila was the ancient intellectual capital of you know, the Indian subcontinent. From here, a lot of knowledge, a lot of traditions, a lot of practices have traveled all over, right? So what is the way today? What are the possibilities of today of any collective discovery today. So it's very difficult, right? So I, I hope I have been able to answer your question. 